Nightmare by Morgan Llewellyn Something was breathing in the dark. Peter lay still for a long time, listening. The sound was coming from the far corner of his bedroom, opposite the windows. In that corner was nothing but a straight-backed chair on which he threw his clothes when he undressed. There was no dog in the room nor even in the house. No creature at all that could be breathing in his bedroom in the middle of the night. Yet, something woke him up. Something that shouldn't be there. The inhalations were ragged and gasping. The way Peter sounded after he jogged several miles the longer he listened, the less human the breathing seemed. He should turn on the light and see what it was. He was too old to be lying with the bedclothes drawn up to his chin because of some strange noise. If he got out of bed and investigated, he would find it was only one of the normal creaks and groans of an old house at night. But he didn't turn on the light. He didn't get up either. Part of him was excited and turning on the light would just spoil the fun. And part of him, he didn't want to admit this to himself. But it was true. Part of him was afraid. He lay rigid in the bed, listening starting to sweat. Maybe this is just a nightmare, he thought. But he didn't believe it. The breathing continued. Who are you? He finally demanded. Unfortunately, his words didn't come out as brave and full of challenge as he intended. His voice quavered reminding him that it had changed not so very long ago. Embarrassed, he cleared his throat and tried again. <clears throat> Who are you? What do you think you're doing in my room? No answer. Only breathing. Pitching his voice as deep as it would go, Peter announced sternly, I'm going to count to five, and then I'm coming over there. You better speak up before you make me really mad. The breathing became harsher, but there was no other response. Now he had to get up. He couldn't make an empty threat like some little kid. He was in charge here after all. He had fought for the right to be able to stay by himself and laughed at Mum when he was uncertain about it. I'm practically grown up, he had reminded her. I can certainly mind the house for a fortnight. The last thing Mum had said before she and Terry left was, You will be alright until we get back, Peter, won't you? He will. Terry had assured her. Then, turning to Peter, he added with a grin, I won't let her worry about a thing. I know you'll handle any problems that come up just fine. I have a feeling we're going to be great pals, you and me. Mum had been lonely for a long time, but lately she had started to sing in the mornings as she cooked breakfast and there was a sparkle in her eyes.
when she and Terry had left that morning to go on their honeymoon. She looked positively radiant. Until that moment, Peter had never realised his mother was a beautiful woman. He couldn't disappoint her now. He had to deal with whatever this was. So he threw back the covers and reached for the switch of the bedside lamp. But, like the house, the lamp was old and not in good repair. No matter how he thumbed the switch, it wouldn't come on. Muttering to himself, he slid out of bed. Beneath his blue striped cotton pyjamas, his stomach felt hollow. When his feet touched the floor, it creaked so loudly, he snatched his feet up again and sat perched on the edge of his bed like some great bird. Then he, he was angry with himself. He felt like a fool. It was all the fault of the house, of course. He had disliked the place from the beginning. It was a tired old farmhouse with a roof that sagged in the middle and some sort of dying vine clinging to the gable end like a drowning man clinging to a rock. The paint was peeling and the room smelled damp. But when Mum and Terry had brought him out here to see it for the first time, their faces had glowed as if they'd done something wonderful. Peter, however, had been dismayed. You're buying a house next to an old cemetery? That's crazy! No, it isn't. It makes good sense, son, Terry had replied calmly. Peter hated it when Terry called him son. But the older man never seemed to notice. Because of the location, we're having to pay less than we would for the same house anywhere else. It may seem sort of shabby right now, but you and I get together, can fix it up on the weekends. It'll be great, you'll see. Look at all the space we're getting. There are lots of bedrooms, including one. He had winked at Mum. That would make a terrific nursery. And there's a huge garden, not to mention quiet neighbours. He added with a laugh. Mum had said, we did so hope you'd like it, Peter, her eyes pleaded with him, like a spaniel's. Digging his hands in his pockets, Peter had scuffed his toe in the dirt as he replied. Sure, I like it, okay. I mean, well, yeah, it's great. Big ugly barn, he had thought to himself. And I guess Terry will expect me to mow that acre of lawn too. What was wrong with the nice little flat in the rat mines, anyway? It had always been big enough for himself and Mum. Before. Now, he was living in a big old house that made strange noises at night. Terribly strange noises. A second something began to gasp along with the first. The breathing. The new one sounded as if it was being forced through a throat clogged with mucus. That's it, Peter told the dark room. I've had enough. He slammed both feet down on the floor hard. Then he fumbled in the bedside locker for the electric torch which he had put there before he went to bed. This was an old house at the far end of the country lane, and it was the season of summer storms. He had anticipated that the electricity might go off any time, although he had not expected the lamp would fail to work. As his fingers closed around the hard, smooth cylinder, he was glad he'd had the sense to plan ahead. The torch was a big one and heavy. Slammed against an intruder's head, it would make a good weapon. 
Ito took a tentative step forward, his ears straining to detect the slightest change in the breathing across the room. But there was no response to his cautious advance. He took another step. A cold draft ran across his bare feet and ankles and sent a shiver up his spine. Where's that coming from? he wondered. Expecting rain, he'd closed the windows before he went to bed. He looked in the direction of the door and squinted. In the gloom, he could just make out the fact that it was standing ajar. Yet he was certain that he'd closed it. He always slept with his door closed. If the door was open, that could explain the draft. But what opened the door? Peter looked back towards the corner which held the mysterious breathing. The darkness seemed darker there and he could see nothing at all. Not even the outline of the chair. He seemed to be looking into a yawning blackness that went on and on without end. Stop that! Peter said aloud. He was scaring himself, and he knew it. There was an electric torch in his hand. All he had to do was turn it on and shine it into the corner. He ran his thumb up the cylinder and pressed the button. Nothing happened. He pressed it again, harder. It was impossible that the lamp and the torch both should fail. The torch made a clicking noise, but no light appeared. If anything, the darkness facing Peter seemed to grow deeper. There was a funny smell too, an unpleasant tang in the air that made him feel queasy. Suddenly, the last thing in the world he wanted to do was to go any further towards that lightless corner. But what else could he do? He was equally reluctant to turn his back on. Whatever it was, and retreat. If he did go back to bed, what then? Just lie there, waiting for wherever it was to come after him? Or should he try to escape? Even as the thought crossed his mind, he heard the door creak on its hinges and slam shut. The draft could have done that, but Peter didn't think so. Giving a cry of pure terror, he broke and ran. Three strides carried him to the door, dropping the torch in his haste. He caught the handle with both hands and almost wrenched it from the wood. For an awful moment, he felt the door wouldn't open. Then he felt it yield. Flinging it wide, Peter raced through and belted for the stairs. His footsteps echoed hollowly on the wooden steps. Once he almost lost his balance and tumbled head first, but he caught him hold at the banister at the last moment. He hardly swallowed his pace, however. When he reached the bottom of the stairs, he ran straight for the front door. Here he stopped and stared. I bolted that last thing before I went to bed, Peter said aloud in astonishment. Yet this door too was standing wide open. For a moment he could not think, could not even move. Someone definitely was in the house. Intruders, burglars, or perhaps something even more sinister. Should he stay and fight, or go for help? He wanted to stay and fight, but only part of him wanted that. The rest of him fortunately was stronger. Peter plunged through the doorway and down the pathway towards the lane. He had no real plan in mind, only an intense desire to put as much distance as possible between himself 
and whatever was in the corner of his bedroom. His bare feet never felt the stones in the path. But, by the time he had gone a few hundred yards down the lane, a different sort of stone caught his attention. He was running past the old graveyard that lay beyond the house. The lopsided grin of a half-moon leered over the scene, outlining broken tombstones that emerged like rows of rotten teeth from the mossy earth. Gradually, Peter slowed to a walk. His heart was still hammering, but at least he was safe distance from the house, and as far as he could tell, nothing was chasing him. He began to feel a little foolish again. Maybe it had been nothing more than rats. Rats and drafts. Or even just a bad dream. He walked on slowly, gazing towards the graveyard. All those dead people. Lives over. Futures cancelled. Nothing to look forward to anymore. What would they give to be able to have a second chance? To be alive again, as he was. The worn tombstones began to have a strange effect on Peter. Instead of feeling a hushed awe, perversely he wanted to whistle and shout, laugh out loud and throw rocks and make as much noise as one boy. One living boy possibly could. He wanted to defy death and fear and darkness. There was nothing to be scared of. Just a lot of broken teeth in the moonlight. He stopped walking and stood in the middle of the lane. Stupid, he said aloud. Stupid. Stupid to run out of the house like some little kid by my own imagination. What would Mum say? The first time he was left alone, he had panicked. He had let her down, and himself as well. She and Terry had only been gone for a day, and here he was, practically wetting himself in the middle of the road just because he had some silly nightmare. That's all it was. A nightmare. His warm bed was waiting for him back there. All he had to do was turn around and go home. Home. Lifting his chin, Peter turned around and started back towards the house. As he walked, a hundred thoughts chased themselves through his head. He'd been resenting Terry, but maybe that was a mistake. Mum was happy, and they did have a home of their own now. They were going to be a family. A real family, with a future. Husband and wife and son, and maybe a baby sometime. A little sister. He'd like that and to think he had almost ruined it. What was the last thing he had said to Terry as they left that morning? Don't hurry back. Peter had hissed under his breath so low that only Mum's new husband could hear. And the car door slammed and, as it drove off, he had stood in front of the house waving and saying loud, although Terry could no longer hear him. You don't have to come back at all as far as I'm concerned. He had meant it just then. But he didn't mean it now. He was so preoccupied he did not hear the car drive up behind him until a man's voice called gently. Are you all right, son? Peter whirled around, half expecting to find Terry sitting in the car and grinning out at him. But it wasn't Terry. 
It was a police car with two strange men in it. One of them got out and came towards him. Are you Peter Ryan? I am. Perhaps we'd better go inside, son. We have some news for you. The man's voice was so gentle that Peter knew at once. He would do anything to keep from hearing what they had come to say. But the two policemen took him inside and turned on the lights and sat him down on a chair in the parlour. Then they told him, Accident. Car crash. Both killed instantly. So, terribly sorry. As if through a roaring fog, Peter heard, not the policeman's words, but the very last thing his mother had said to him. He'd been wrong. It wasn't. You will be all right, Peter, won't you? Just before the car that would kill them drove away, she had leaned towards him with that radiant, happy smile and said, We'll come back to you, Peter. I promise. We'll always come back to you. With dawning horror, Peter looked past the policeman towards the stairs and his bedroom and whatever waited in the corner.